list. The first topic, port numbers. So, does anybody have their port numbers memorized? No. So, step one, these need to be memorized. But let's talk about what each one does. And before that, notice I left some white space here. So, let's take it back to even more basic. What is a port? And this is, believe it or not, this is a, what? What is a port? This is an interview question I ask security engineers to explain what this word means. What is a port? Well, we, we, we see all these port number references and whatnot, but can anyone explain what a port is? A port as in an interface or a, a, a protocol, not an interface. Not like a USB port. That's probably not a good definition, but they just do the same thing so many times that they just had to specialize a channel to do this thing, you know, a million times. I, I, I don't know. No, I, I like that. Like a specialized channel. I like that. Um, and, and I kind of think of it as the same way. So I think of a port as an imaginary roadway. Right, a roadway for a specific type of data. And this can be referencing anything. It could be, uh, so like a, a program can specify the need for a specific port. Or a network device can specify the need for a different port. So let's just say I write a program. This is going to be real interesting. Be ready to be awed. I'm going to write a program. Program, see, dot exe. That means it's a program. All right, I just wrote a program and I'm a developer now. Not really, but if I write this program, I might want this program to have specific functionality. Like for example, if I wanted to send email, I need this program to be able to use port 25 because the job of port 25 is to send email. So these port numbers are specifically saying hey what type of traffic do you want to have access to use and like it in my environment you know sometimes we create a new virtual machine like I created a new uh, a new uh, Linux collector for a specific software last or a few weeks ago but that specific virtual machine had to have a few select ports open because that was the type of data it was transmitting so a port think of a port as an imaginary roadway that that is labeled as a specific type or a specific function of data. I might want this to get online. I want this program.exe to be able to get online. I might give it access to port 80 if it's unsecure or 443 HTTP, which we're about to talk about. So think of ports as roadways that are, are meant to have a specific type of data or a specific function. That's why they're called protocols, because if nothing had protocols, everything would just be kind of projectile vomited onto the internet without any order. Does this definition, kind of basic definition, help us understand what a port is? always have a way of taking these things that when I see them in the textbook I'm like oh my god this is like such a crazy concept how am I going to break this down and then I come and sit in this class for 12 minutes and you've already explained it <laughs> um, I, mean, that, I mean that's ultimately what it is it's just uh, hey what, what what kind of data does this roadway carry that's, that's, that's all it is Yep, I agree, Randy, in, in the Twitch chat. I, I like that a lot. I'm going to steal that. So Randy in the Twitch chat said, yeah, you could have a monorail coming out, or you could have a freight train or a commuter train. Yeah, that would be different different trains for different types of purposes, right? Like, I'm not going to send email over port 389. Like, that, that port is not meant for that type of traffic. Exactly right. Before we get to the actual, oh, good. No, 
That's all good. Yeah. Well, and, and realistically, if it was just puked out of our networks in the same format, the same protocol, you'd have to have some network device there that says, all right, what type of data is this, where, and how do we send it? So, I mean, it, w it would slow down the internet a lot if we didn't have ports and protocols. I agree with that. Yeah, it would be a, it would be a nightmare. Good question. Good good observation, Watson. <laughs> uh, Tigger asked, are ports fixed? Can I say I want port 80 as HTTPS instead? Like breaking the rule. Um, th so they are standardized, and there's, there's going to be a few specific groupings of them that we're going to get to. Like well-known ports are the first 1,024. Now, some of the higher ports can be used for multiple functions, but that doesn't mean just any function. So, I mean, if you tried to send email on a non-email port, you would get all kinds of crazy errors because the rest of the internet doesn't recognize that as as the correct train, right? Like, I mean, you could take a commuter train and pour coal into it and move it. It's just going to be a huge nightmare, right? <laughs> I'm totally stealing that train uh, train metaphor, Randy. <laughs> it's, it's how I've always thought about it. You know, ports being a train station. It's how I've always thought about it. Yep. Now, there are 65,535 ports. You need to know all of them. <laughs> you need to know all of them, said nobody. But <laughs> one thing that is really important, every port can either be labeled TCP or UDP. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say every port, but ports in general have two major labels. It would be TCP port 25 or UDP 25. You don't have to memorize which ports can specify TCP or UDP. So you don't have to memorize that at all. But you do have to know the difference between TCP, which is Transmission Control Protocol. Uh, protocol. Okay, I didn't jack it up too much. Yeah, I did. Now, now that I say that. So, Transmission Control Protocol versus User Datagram Protocol. Now, the difference in these guys is that TCP verifies connectivity. It actually verifies that the data was received as intended. So if you send data on a port utilizing that port number as a TCP connection, it sends the data, and then it sends a verification that says, hey, did the data get there? User Datagram Protocol does not verify. So some evil verbiage that gets attached to that, TCP can be also described as connection-oriented, which is really weird. But that's just a super nerd way of saying, hey, it verifies that the data actually got there. UDP, connection lists. Now, just from those basic caveman definitions, right? Because, <laughs> I mean, that's... It's about as simple as it gets, right? Um, which one do you think is faster? UDP, right? Faster. Less secure, but faster. Now, that being said, why would we even use UDP? two major uses for it video streaming netflix hulu amazon prime whatever video streaming crap disney peacock how many video streaming things are there oh, you know, a million right but if, if you're trying to watch a, a netflix movie 
and the data is not coming through, do you need some system to be like, hey, your movie sucks? Or do you already know? <laughs> yeah, you already know. Yep. Another classic example, gaming. If you're gaming online, those are all UDP data transmissions. Anybody who games on games on the internet at all knows that if you're not getting the data you need, you see weird stuff in your game. That's when you start rubber banding or just, uh, you know, you're playing Call of Duty and you get headshotted and you see nobody because the latency is so extreme. But for most of you, you just suck at that game and it's not lag, it's you. That's me. I was terrible at gaming until it became cross-platform. Then it became awesome. <laughs> what a split gate. Oh, okay. Oh, very cool. Everybody's saying Halo with Portal. Halo with Portal. <laughs> also, I could get, like, shot in the back when my back's against the wall. That's great. I would suck even more then. <laughs> Before we get into the ports, do I have any questions on these basic basic uh, descriptions up here. Oh, no, that's pretty much everything else. I mean, every time you send an email or even a request on a website, most of it's connected and oriented. Most of it's confirmed. I mean, can you imagine if we send an email, but it wasn't verified? Like, eh, they might have got it. <laughs> I would actually have an excuse to not read my work emails in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, someone said IMAP is TCP. Most email ports are going to be TCP. Absolutely. I say most. I don't know of any ones that is not, but I'm just going to say most in case someone finds some weird example. <laughs> I don't like to use definite terms when describing anything. There's always an exception. Standardized, yeah, email ports would be TCP. No questions on any of this? Uh, uh, kind of trying to jump ahead with the difference between POP3 and IMAP. And yeah. We're going to get to that here coming up in a little bit. Yeah, we are. I'm very skeptical with this many people. No, no questions. I'll pretend to believe. Yes. Just see, all I would say is. Um, before we get to it, if you're really, really interested, look up what IMAP stands for and look what POP3 stands for, and it should get you in the right direction of what you're answering until Sean goes over it. You know what's funny? I didn't even have the uh, the voice chat open. I'm like, there's no way no one has questions. <laughs> okay, all right. Good questions. Yeah, we're going to go through each one of these individual ports. Absolutely. That's Everybody's just waiting, like, get to the ports. Let's do it. All right. Keep these definitions short and sweet and like scott said earlier you, you can you can wikipedia the hell out of these and get 25 pages don't, don't do that mm -mm. yeah don't do that but please don't do that so secure shell port 22 so secure shell is a remote access protocol and think of this as the most basic because this term gets a little bit more uh, convoluted uh, later in, in NetPlus and Security Plus. Um, now, Secure Shell is most basic, but we use this a lot 
to uh, to remote into other PCs at work. You can SSH SSH in the command prompt space IP address, and you've accessed that that resource if you have a uh, you know, permission to do so. So secure shell is a very commonly used remote access. Typically, typically it's going to be text based. So another reason why all the commands, whether it be Linux or Windows, all the commands are uh, super important. You might not have a desktop if you're remoting into it something. Yeah, terminal or command prompt. Command prompt being Windows CLI, terminal being Linux or Apple CLI, <laughs> Linux. Yep, yeah, Addy, we're, we're about to hit the uh, IMAP and POP differences. That's definitely going to be a major takeaway from this part. Telnet. For the love of God, disable it. Support 23, Telnet. Really simple way to memorize this. Unsecure text-based remote access. Um, has anybody used PuTTY in their work environments? No, Addy, TKIP, TKIP is attached to WPA, wireless encryption. Yes, yep, solar putty, yep. So the thing about Telnet, you want it to completely disabled if you're talking about external connections. So from outside of the network to inside of the network, no secure environment is going to let port 23 go across the, the default gateway. It's, it's, it literally transmits passwords in plain text, but it's still heavily used. So imagine you work in a, you get an IT job in a giant manufacturing facility and you have warehouses that's, you know, one PC is a half mile away from another PC. You can rem use t uh, port 23 to remote into other PCs inside an already secured network. But you never want to select Telnet or Port 23 as a remote connection protocol that's, uh, that's going to anywhere, any location outside of your local area network. I work in a, a banking institution, so this is pretty much shut down across the board in every single thing we touch. So 23 is specifically labeled as unsecure, and the test is going to ask you to know that in more ways than one, almost guaranteed. Yep, 23, unsecure tech space. Absolutely. I think I had like two or three questions about that just wanted you to know that you should be using SSH and not Telnet. I'm like, man, free points. Gift wrapped. Burns, uh, Turns wants to know, um, did we just skip over 2021 for FTP? Yeah, because we're, 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 I want to do... Um, <laughs> Fun fact, so I, I dropped that out of here because uh, I really want to hammer the difference between FTP, SFTP, and FTPS. Because that that's, yeah. that's super important and a huge pain in the ass, so that's why we didn't hit it first. <laughs> Very good question, Kearns. But yeah, it, uh, that, that's on the side burner until this. And for some reason, CompTIA loves to throw those in there. I, don't know, I won't complain about that yet. <laughs> I won't complain about that yet. But, all right, port 25. So, let's go ahead and just identify these early. Port 25, 143, and 110. These are your email ports. And 25 is easy. Even though it stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, I always tell students, think of it as sending mail to 25 people, because that's what port 25 does, sends email. Now, the exam might say this in a different way. They might give you a long-winded question about relaying email. 
So if you think about it, relaying email is the same thing as sending email. So don't fall victim or don't overthink that. If you're relaying something, you're still sending it. Classic questions. What's the difference between POP and IMAP? So both of these receive or retrieve email. You can see it written either way. Both of these receive email. The big difference is on a classic standard POP setup, if you receive email using POP, it does not save a copy on a server. It doesn't save a copy on a server. Example. Let's just say my email is set up with a pure POP receiving protocol, port 110. And Scott sends me an email. If I check that email on my phone, it's only on my phone. I can't go to a laptop and find it in an inbox. That email is always going to be on my phone. Whereas IMAP, if I have an IMAP set up, it does save a copy on the server. So I can check the email on my phone and then go to my laptop and find it and then my desktop and find it. Now, I think what really confuses people on this is we're used to using web-based email. So if you go to gmail.com and you're checking your email, you're not deciding any of this on web-based email. But if you're talking about like Microsoft Exchange where you're actually setting up email clients for users or an email client on a, on a cell phone, that's when these really come into play. So these are, I mean, these are used in web-based email, but it's not something that you have to dictate for gmail.com. Whereas if you're setting up an email program for a, a user on a phone, you will have to dictate these. I, I think that usually clears up a lot of confusion when people are thinking about email, whether they're checking it on a web-based platform or, or not. Quick pause. Any questions on what's here? Well, our poor help desk has to. Because we're, we're a banking institution, so we have to apply PCI regulations to our emails. So our poor help desk deals with a lot of this. I mean, if you're going into a banking environment or anywhere that handles credit card data, yeah, you're going to be doing this. Because you, you can't just I, use web-based. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Scott. So when I was working at my the pharmacy, doing all the pharmacy tech, um, when we set up new pharmacy, old pharmacies, everything like that. Uh, every email I was managing had to set up, had to, I mean, so yes, it, it is very common. Um, most are going to use a dedicated or their own server where it's not going to be just through like Gmail or whatnot. Oh, and, Ro and Roz asked the question. So, so I was waiting for someone to pivot into this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So these are the basic ports for these. Now, on the A-plus objective list, there, there's not secure ports listed. It would be kind of ridiculous not to memorize them right now because they're coming hard. So, secure versions of these ports. For 25 SMTP, there's also 465 whoops, or 587. And even though they're not on the objective list, I have seen these pop up in a very... Uh, very specific phone email simulation on Core 1. So if you get a simulation where you're plugging in port numbers to a cell phone on a on Core 1, the test is going to ask you for basic ports, like standard ports, or it might say secure ports. So I would definitely know these. For POP, the secure port is 995. For IMAP, 993. So I think 
uh, like Tigger and Randy are kind of uh, trying to get in their head what what the post office for Thymap or, or online. So when when we talk about no web based, you know we're we're not talking like Gmail. We're not talking. Um, it is yes, it is web based, meaning that it transmits over the internet. It's just the server is. You, it goes back to dedicated servers. There, there, you have bought a dedicated mail server that you have to set up the emails on, and those emails go through a management protocol, the IMAP, to where you know your IT person can see every email that's going through. It, it's not just you know you set up a company, pull out a whole bunch of yeah, GoDaddy is exactly like the, uh, uh, Raspberry. Um, you know, I mm -hmm. used one called. Um, brain fart on it. Um, blue, blue something. I can't remember what it's called. But it was basically just a mail server that you had a certain amount of emails that you would build out of it, and then you went to each computer and you set up a specific port and a specific SMT and a specific IMAP and everything, and it would transition through that server and then to wherever it was going. And ultimately, you know, the 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 point of that is. Two, you're you're not going to be setting up protocols for Gmail. They already have their own stuff. So their their web server probably uses IMAP, or it uses POP with server saving enabled. Because there are settings yes. to to make POP act like IMAP. So either one, but they w the test will not ask you which one of these ports are TCP and UDP. They will not. They've never asked that. Never, never, never. So don't stress about that. Well, Outlook is web-based and it's client-based, so it really like, it really depends on how you set Outlook up. Like, all my coworkers use the actual the, the Outlook clients, whereas I use the web-based Outlook at work. Because if you use Outlook client, you probably know it's jacked up half the time. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's I do not like the Outlook client at all. I mean, there's a lot of servers you can rent if you want to rent your own, your own private email server. And actually, funny you ask that, next class, we're going to get into virtualization and cloud. So platform as a service versus infrastructure as a service. Um, get a little bit cloudy in those terms. <laughs> yeah, th th literally that word cloud is just someone else's server. That that's all it is. Yeah. Um, someone asked, "Why would you? What's the difference, and why would you use these two? Well, it, think think back ten years ago, where does anybody remember having like an email volume limit that was like less than a gigabyte? I, I remember running it, into issues with that back in the day. So when that was a problem, pure pop was used a lot more often because it was a lot less volume being saved. Or if you're in a really, really, really strict, secure environment, they might not want a copy saved anywhere." You might only be accessing your email from one specific device, and that's it. Those two examples would, would dictate, hey, let's use pure pop. Other than that, IMAP's going to be a, 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 a go-to. Or pop with IMAP functionality enabled. That's also an option that we don't have to dive into. Don't worry, we'll have uh, lots of practice on port numbers. DNS. We already know what DNS does. Domain name system. So this converts FQDNs to IP address. Anybody remember what an FQDN is? That is a frequently queried domain name. Well, where's my... Close. <laughs> Fully qualified domain name. Sorry, I got that's a fancy way to say website and actually today we're going to talk about dns records and i'll tell you the pain in the ass problem i had with dns records this week it was a long project but dns don't confuse dns with dhcp so remember dhcp automatically assigns ip addresses
So DHCP is the reason that you can jump on someone's Wi-Fi and not have to put in your own IP address because it automatically chooses one for you. I'm going to try to keep these boxes isolating these terms because I don't like boxes. Uh, bootstrap or boot P hasn't been mentioned in a long time. I would be really shocked if you saw boot P or bootstrap on any modern CompT exam. Man, I, you just took me back. You just took me back like three test generations. <laughs> oh, I remember yeah, that. I had to go back and remember what boot P was. Holy cow. Same port numbers. Boot, if you see boot P, that's like the old school version of DHCP. All right, let's talk about this. Trivial file transfer protocol. For some reason, this is the first port everybody memorizes. I don't know why. But TFTP port 69 is unsecure file transfer. So this is unsecure file transfer, and that's another one where the test probably or test can ask you in some way to know that this is unsecure. This is not a secure way to send files, and uh, that's going to be in stark contrast to the FTP, FTPS kind of stuff we're going to talk about. I always remember that one, other than the, the port number, is trivial means not important. That's the definition of trivial. If it's not important, it doesn't need to be secured. I agree with that, 100%. Port 80, basic internet traffic. So port 80 is literally everything that's not secure on the internet. Now what's funny is, let's go to a, let's go to a website. Uh, bank website. Let's tr pick a bank that I don't use. Um, Wells Fargo. I don't use Wells Fargo. Nothing I'm aware of. Oh, Wells Fargo website sucks. Loading. Loading. Make sure you don't have your stuff in it. I'm like 80% sure I don't have a Wells Fargo bank account. <laughs> Wow, okay, let's pick another, another bank website. Maybe they should hire me to secure their bank websites. That's that's uh, down right now. Um, while, while we're waiting on this, uh, Waga Jr. In, in Twitch asked um, what makes the difference between trivial uh, file transfer protocol and file transfer protocol different in security. So port 2021 for file transfer is just considered more secure simply because with, with FTP, you can, you're can you usually attaching something else to it. Uh, for example, if you use FTP with SSH, that's SFTP. So FTP usually has other secure ports backing it up, whereas Trivial is just basic and will not. And we're, we're going to get into what happens to FTP when you use it over Secure Shell versus SSL. All right, here's a credit union I found. So notice up top, right, if you if you go to EECU, this is a credit union somewhere near me, but it has HTTPS here, identifying that it's using port 443. If I try to remove that S and apply it, It will not load it. It will not load this website using port 80. Port 80 is blocked. And it makes sense. Why in the hell would you want to log on to a bank website using basic non-secure internet traffic? So on this server and like all of our servers at what we use at work, port 80 is never opened. So I would be shocked if you could find a financial institution that you had to actually log into. Not, not just a marketing website but one that you had to actually log into that wasn't 443 yeah all of our servers I, I manage a web application firewall that has about 80 bank websites 80 ironically 80 but port 80 is disabled across the board you're not going to be using port 80 for anything important
I used to call this one the port that everybody forgets. And I don't know why, but not even kidding. Of all the classes I've ever taught, for some reason, classes usually get burned on this one. So 161 and 162 is SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol. So this port is used to manage networks. I would write in your notes, this is used to load management or diagnostic software over a network. So if you get questions about loading any kind of diagnostic software, it's going to be over port 161, 162. This is a very, very, very important one. When you get to Security Plus, you actually we, we look at some uh, attacks, some SNMP attacks that happen when admins don't disable this after use. So really, really, really important port. Super important, actually. But it's the one that everyone forgets. Are you guys talking about scammers and phishing websites? <laughs> yeah, the, the um, whatever I said is uh, so if you go to a bank that it does not have the S um, or that's technically using port 80, is that most likely a bogus one? I said yes, that's danger, danger. Um, that is most likely one of two things. It's a phishing site, which means don't put in your stuff. Uh, or it could possibly be that their SSL certificate is, but don't worry about that. That's information for later. Um, but yes, you, you don't want to put information in if it's not an HTTPS. HTTPS. Yep. Don't, don't put it in. There's not a lock in the top left corner. It is unsecure. It's funny you say that because I was talking to my VP yesterday about the, the the attack analytics on our networks, and we have a lot of those networks. Like a lot of those financial institutions are, you know, e-commerce institutions. But on the firewall that I manage, we had 30,000 SQL injection attempts this week. This week, <laughs> like 30,000 attempts, 100% blocked, but the they're they're trying every financial institution they can they can see. They're attempting it for sure. Um, kind of. Uh, it's kind of getting on a side note here, but if you want to look in what's really dangerous right now, check out API attacks. That's dangerous. Another platform that I manage as well as I can. Um, API protection is going to be the future of. IT security, super dangerous. But back to ports. SQL attacks, <laughs> SQL attacks have been around. Just a quick side note on that. Um, SQL attacks have been around for a while. Uh, Ten years ago, when I was doing IT for pizza places, um, we had one where the owner called us up and was like, "Hey, I uh, I keep giving away free pizzas." We're like, "What do you mean?" And sure enough, what he had set up his own website and we just managed it, but he did not change the SQL properly, and so that what they were doing was just SQL injecting the price of their pizza to zero dollars and <laughs> getting a free pizza. Yeah, that's his fault for not hiring proper IT security. Yeah. Well. Um, so these next two ports are ones are two ports that the test is going to try to uh, trick you with, right? LDAP, which is three eight nine. And RDP, which is 3389. The easiest way to remember this, I think, think about this. LDAP has four letters and three numbers. RDP has three letters and four numbers. 
So 389 versus 3389, they're opposites. Does everybody see what I mean by LDAP has four letters, three numbers? RDP has three letters, four numbers. So I don't know if that helps you. That, that, that helped me memorize it instantly. But both of these are remote access protocols. However, lightweight directory access protocol brings up an interesting term. Does, does anybody know what a directory is? What does that word directory mean in the nerd world? Folders, yeah. That, that, yeah, Waga said it, folders. That's all it means. A, a folder is a directory. Now, with lightweight directory access protocol, this is a little bit different. So you're not using LDAP to remote in and use a computer. So LDAP, think of this like a phone book. So I can I can get on the network, in, or not on my network because it's shut down, but a non-bank network, and I can use LDAP to search for objects like a phone book. So if I need to find someone's email or someone's um, like like a resource information on a network, like I need to figure out what the IP address to a printer is, I can use LDAP like a phone book for my network just to do queries and searches on objects in the network. And that's 100% what it is. It's it's used to look up objects, email, user information, user accounts, Active Directory accounts, printers, servers. It's literally just a phone book. Don't confuse this with remote desktop. Remote and having control of another PC. Literally using another PC remotely. Um, kind, kind, yeah, kind of like when you're, you're like writing an email and it, it kind of autofills and shows you everyone you, that starts with that, that search, right? Yeah, very much like that. But think of it as on the entire network, not just email. So LDAP is a remote connection protocol, but not remotely connecting a PC. Whereas RDP is remotely connecting a PC. On RDP, I would also note MSTSC because when you actually go and hit Windows R and run MSTSC, Microsoft Terminal Service Console, something like that, this pops up. So if you go to your first IT job or another IT job and they say, hey, remote into this IP address, Windows R, MSTSC. Boom, you got remote desktop connection ready to roll. Yeah, there are. Yeah, there are. I mean, you, you, you probably have to be on the network already, though. You, you'd have to be uh, credentialed onto the network, which is a whole other day. Um, I, I wouldn't call LDAP uh, natively secure. I'll give you an example. LDAP is completely shut down in our, in our environment. There's no LDAP options. <laughs> oh, so, so MSTSC, that's the actual Windows interface that we, you would use to open remote desktop. So like if you hit Windows R to run a program and this type MSTSC, that opens whatever screen it's on here that opens remote desktop so mstsc is pretty much how you directly access remote desktop on a on a windows pc in core 2 we're going to talk a lot about a lot about how i mean if you're an admin you're not using the start menu very often it's not really a thing. You're just going to hit Windows R and go directly to wherever you want to in Windows. So the start menu is kind of a user thing in Windows, for being honest. Basic user. Uh, can you explain SNMP again? So SNMP, 
that that's a management protocol. Meaning, if I need to, maybe a, a, for example, not that this is a direct test question or anything, but I want to load a software on my network that monitors all CPU usage on the servers. So this software, its only job is to monitor CPU usage and, and generate a report. If I'm loading any kind of diagnostic or management software, it's going to be on 161 or 161 and 162. Does that help, uh, Intro V? Yeah. Hey, uh, all this is definitely net plus test material, too. <laughs> the, the, this class and the last class is, is all net plus testable as well. So it, it's definitely a good, uh, good rehash of it. Four four three. We know that this is secure web browsing, secure web traffic. Now I don't think you're going to get hit with this one, but just looking at server message block SMB or the old school SIFs, what do you think the function of server message block is? server message block uh th think of this as a block of data not like it's blocking something that, that's a good point actually so what this what this server message block does so this allows pcs to transfer data and i think more accurately request data from server file shares. Kind of a rare one. I would really be shocked if you got that on A+. But server message block, think of it as it lets PCs request blocks of data from servers. That's how I think of it. It allows computers to request blocks of data from servers. All right, the last port. So remember uh, someone, I think Kearns brought up file transfer protocol, port 20 and 21. And that is just it. It's the most basic file transfer protocol we have, 20 and 21. It's not unsecure, but it's definitely got its fallacies now FTP the curveball here is SFTP versus FTPS huge difference in these two and the test might ask you which one of these three is most secure so SFTP is secure shell with FTP meaning it's just using ports 20 21 and 22 so sftp is more secure than ftp it adds another layer of security however ftps is ftp over ssl and i would go ahead and note that this is the most secure and specifically we use port 990 so realistically, this is using port 20 and 21. This is using port 443 for HTTPS, and it's using port 990 as an added layer of file transfer security over a web browser. Oh, good question. What is SSL? My bad. So SSL is secure socket layer. And this literally just means when you see SSL, web browser traffic. You have to know that that's web browser traffic specifically when SSL is mentioned. My fault. I forgot to define that. That's one of my pet peeves, using a term without defining it. My, my fault. <laughs> D 
does this kind of um, rainbow cheat sheet help us understand ports more? Don't read too deep into ports. If you know what's on this page, the test really can't burn you on anything. you're telling me that these are all the key points to know then i'm on board captain mm -hmm. and honestly in reality you'll you'll definitely get you'll definitely get email ports that that's going to happen some of you might get a few other ones of these some of you might not get any of these in the exam it depends on your test some of you get two or three port questions some of you will just see email ports and that's it <laughs> Sean, Kern wants to know about ports 137 and 139. I'm pretty sure you run those later on in security flight. Oh, That's so, that. yeah, they're on the core one objective list. They are. Um, I never included net buoy because I haven't seen that on an A-plus exam in, like, five-plus years. Yeah, I can't yeah. remember seeing one on any of the A-pluses as well. Yeah, that's that. I, I mean, I had never covered that in class simply because we never ever got it on exams. And yeah, yeah, it's it's super weird. It's very weird. And net net bios or net buoy, however, however you pronounce it, um, it's it's legacy. It's pretty old technology. I don't know why it would still be included, but I would be shocked if you got that on the exam. Have you given them that Quizlet fun exercise that you get, uh, that you were you gave out where you can do the matching? Yeah, I think I showed them on the first day, didn't I? I believe so. Yeah, if you guys haven't used Quizlet before, the, I think the fastest way to memorize these, if you're going to a, a, a flashcard set on Quizlet, you can do this matching game. And this matching game, I think, helps you memorize this sets of data the fastest. Now there's a few extra ones in here that, like 5004, 5005 got dropped until net plus. But uh, there you go, port 2021. If you drag it over to FTP, wherever FTP is, uh, am I blind? Or is it? Oh, it's all. It is okay. Yeah. So it dis it disappears. <laughs> so. If you drag it to the right one, it disappears. If you drag it to the wrong one, secure, FT, secure SMTP, port 6768. Nope, it slingshots it away. And the timer always runs on the on the left-hand side. So uh, something else you can do with this matching game that I think is cool. Let me refresh it. If you hold control and scroll up to zoom in to where they're overlapping and then refresh it, it goes to the cell phone view. So that means you can just casually, I'm at 143, 23 telnet, a port, RDP 3389, 69 trivial, 123 NTP. Um, and you'll see, you see the leaderboard. I've had students, a lot of students under 10 seconds doing this. <laughs> so it's really, uh, really, really helpful just to memorize sets of data. So give that a try when you have free time. It's, it's, it's fun. Sego said top 15. <laughs> Dude, I can't believe it's already 9 o'clock. It's already been an hour. Questions, concerns, complaints. The, the test won't, won't ask you specifically which ones are which. They're more so going to ask you to know the difference in general TCP versus UDP descriptions. That That's going to be the focal point. Yeah, they're, they're not all just TCP. A lot of these offer TCP or UDP options depending on the application. 
So you, you do not have to memorize specific numbers attached to TCP or UDP. All right, we've, it's already begun. The go TV is in his in the top fifteen. Who can beat him? Come on, CEO, get top ten. You got it. <laughs> It gets addictive trying to get up in the get close to like Sean and whatnot. Like I, that's how I studied all my uh, security plus stuff, and it was um, it, like you just get into a groove. I got so upset when I'd misclick something and kill my time. <laughs> all right, let's take a quick coffee and uh, restroom refill. Uh, re, yeah, restroom refill, coffee refill, and restroom break, real quick. About eight minutes. Sound good? I need more coffee. Like before, I'll, I will stay on. Uh, if you guys have any questions.
just train wrecked basic questions. I mean, I, I even asked somebody like, "Hey, what's a hash?" You know, for a security engineer, you should know what a hash is. But I mean, just basic questions. So you can go in with three bachelor's degrees and certifications and still get train wrecked if you don't, if you're not able to explain the basics like we are today. You know what I mean? That, that's a potato dish, a, a very delicious potato dish, right? Yes, hash. <laughs> well, and, and I always told I always told my students, don't say I don't know in an interview. Never say I don't know. If they ask you like, what is port forty seven eighty three? Well, I'm not going to say I, I don't know what that is, but I'm not going to say I don't know. I would I would respond with how I would find the answer. Exactly. Don't don't say I don't know. I, I mean, especially in like a security analyst, security engineer job, we, we want to know if you're going to going to try to find the answer because that's 99 percent of your job finding the answers. <laughs> I mean, if, if don't say I don't. I mean, it's to, totally acceptable to be like, you know what? I uh, I haven't come across that, but the way I'd find it is I would go through this, or if that's something that I would need in my daily, I would make sure that I was ready for it. You know. I don't know is a shutdown answer. It is telling them that not only do you not have the information, it is not important enough for you to figure it out. Would it be considered a smart aleck answer? Like, hey, the thing that's port is interesting. Is that... Um, <laughs> no, I wouldn't go there. Well, all right, let's, 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 uh, let's, 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 Scott, let's, let's, let's get back to, uh, Let's let's get let's get back to this because we have a long quiz. We have a very long quiz coming up. Not a whole lot of information today. I mean, the whiteboard's pretty low, and we're gonna watch some videos for the networking tools part. But our quiz is gonna take some time. <laughs> um, so we'll definitely get back onto it. Um, last note on that though, I was kind of thinking about doing like a middle of the week resume tips slash interview tips kind of a uh, boot camp would anybody be interested in that you ought to be so I, I, i've written a lot of resumes yeah so i think there's there's some some tips that can really slingshot your resume to the top if you uh use them appropriately all right so there's a plethora of other network devices that we have to talk about that you're going to find basically described in your A+. Um, has anybody seen something like this picture before? And we are going to talk about the tools we use to attach these later. But this is a patch panel. Um, you might see it described as a 66 block, old school, or a 110 block as well. But notice, th these these are Ethernet cables coming in, but they're not connected with an RJ45 ferrule, right? They're not connected with an actual end cap. The actual individual colors are punched down with a punch down tool, which we'll talk about, onto a patch panel. So realistically, when we get to OSI model, this is a layer one technology. But with a patch panel, if you look closely, it's marine proof. You literally can't mess it up. There's a color-coded diagram on every connection. So <laughs> this is a way to... Uh... <laughs> Jeff, is that you looking at the patch panels in that picture? <laughs> but th this is a way to connect a lot of incoming Ethernet cables to one central location for, for better management. So you could have patch panels or you could have switches here to connect them, either one. But it really depends on how the infrastructure is set up. So a key note from this, the patch panel does not use an RJ45 connector. It uses the individual color cables punched down inside of the, uh, the cat cable. First day in the job. So the, a, a, a patch panel is a generic description of it. More specific descriptions might be like a 66 block or a 110 block. So a 66 block is a smaller patch panel, a 110 block is a little bit bigger of a patch panel. 
uh, any cat cable. This could be cat three if you really had a slow network. Cat three, cat eight, but it doesn't matter which cat cables. They have, they have the same color codes inside. Oh, come on, Randy. It's not that much on this whiteboard. Yep, that is, that's definitely following the GoBob, the T568 standards. But really, for a patch panel, you don't have to memorize the standards. Like, the, like the charts are actually printed on here, on, on most patch panels. Um, and similarly, uh, let me go ahead and put another picture up here. If you've ever worked in an environment, or maybe your home has these, where you have an Ethernet, Ethernet plug in, in the wall... Like, you just plug your Ethernet cable up to a, a wall plug. You know, the back of that wall jack is the same thing. Each one of those individual colors get gets pushed down into a connection that's printed on the actual wall jack. So this is the back of a, a, of a wall jack. And this will make a lot more sense when we watch some videos about the tools that are used to actually do that. All right, firewalls, and this is kind of uh, getting into PoE down there. We'll, we'll ignore that for now. So one thing about firewalls that I think confuses a lot of people, they can be put anywhere. You can put a firewall in any point in your network. You can put it right behind the router. You can put it right in front of individual servers. A firewall its job is literally just to filter traffic based on the ACL. If you don't know what an ACL is, please write this down. ACL, access control list. A list of allow or deny permissions. That's simply what it is. A list of allow or deny permissions. In NetPlus and Security Plus, we'll get into um, ACL management and kind of look at some ACLs to see how those rules apply and in which order they apply. So it gets a little bit more complicated later. So a firewall is a filter. It's a giant filter. That's all it is. And there's a list of rules, and that traffic either is allowed according to those rules or denied. Now... There are two differences in firewalls. So you have a state list versus a state full firewall. Super important for all three exams, by the way. So a state list firewall is basic. So this is a basic firewall. Allows or denies based on the ACL. A state full firewall does that as well. But additionally, a state fool will watch traffic patterns while connected to the network. So think, uh, a student said this once, and I think it is probably the best way to describe this. A stateless firewall is like somebody checking your IDs at the door to a club. So are you 21 or not? That's the only ACL rule they're looking for. Are you 21 or not? A state full firewall is like the bouncer. I mean, they can also check your ID, but they'll also whoop your ass and kick you out of the club if you're doing something stupid inside, right? <laughs> so that, that's what a state full firewall does. It watches to make sure you're not doing anything malicious inside the network. It watches for traffic patterns. Now everybody's thinking about when they got bounced out of their first club, right? <laughs> Uh-oh. Never. I have never been kicked out of the bar in the U.S. I can say that much. In the U.S. Yeah, it's... I gotta be honest. In the United States, I've never been kicked out of a bar. <laughs> I 
Nah, man, Philippines and Thailand were rough, uh, rough years for me, right? <laughs> not Oki. No, I never got in trouble in Oki. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> Pretty straightforward definitions. Um, does this help us kind of get a general idea of what a firewall is and the difference between stateless and stateful? Again, you've done another break it down color by numbers explanation. All right. Love it. That's our goal here, right? Barney style, I like it. Yeah, stateless is your basic firewall. Stateful, it had to be an actual stateful defined firewall. Now, uh, it's, it's hard to say, like, yes, this is better and yes, this is worse. It depends on the network setup. Because uh, some more advanced networks might have other security devices, like an IPS or IDS or UTM that we're going to talk about today, that act as other security barriers. Oh, actually, light work. Very good question. And uh, that actually opens up a bigger question. Firewalls can be physical devices or software. That's a really good point that I, I forgot. Can be hardware or software. So you can have a hardware firewall with a software firewall loaded onto it. Really good bullet point, actually. Thank you for that. So what type of traffic will a firewall prevent? So firewalls can apply rules on ports. Like you can block certain ports. You can block URLs. You can block traffic type. Uh, you can do uh, rate limiting where, hey, this resource is trying to send us 3,000 requests per minute. Nope, shut it down. So firewalls can have all kinds of allow or block rules or let's just, uh, one example I ran into uh, you know we blocked an entire country <laughs> simply because this country is not nice uh, when it comes to malware attempts but we had one we had one uh, one business that had a contractor there so I had to we had to go into the firewall and put a specific rule like allow this IP address over this device only kind of an allow through it you would think I don't know you would you would think it was Russia China or North Korea but I mean the Philippines is a big problem for for us Jordan there's there's a lot of weird countries that uh, have popped up as their own little problems Russia does make a lot of attempts, but a lot of Russian attempts are like children, childish, well-known bot attempts. So I'm not really worried about Russia. So Quickie Cheeky wants to know, Unify Security Gateway, is that a, uh, I just lost it, is that a firewall? I, I'm not sure with that brand. Yeah. You, I'm not. I'm not sure with the brand Unify, but if you have default gateways with firewall software loaded onto it, it would definitely act like a firewall. And then Toxic asks, can a firewall be also a router? I assume so, since it deals with internet traffic. Or are they different? Ooh. So can a firewall be a router? No. Can a firewall be a default gateway? Yes. So remember the, the base function of a router is to determine actual routing paths, right? But in our home networks, those routers are the default gateway. On a larger network, the default gateway might not be just a router. So that default gateway, the, the bridge between internal and external overall, might be a different network device. It could even be a layer three switch when we get into networking. And then Jeff Boy, I got I got it. Um, depending on the type, it can. So like our web application firewall, our WAF, specifically targets DDoSing. So yeah, certain types of firewalls can prevent DDoSing. For those, of which you guys will learn in 
So it has to be on that one. For, so for those of you uh, not familiar with DDoS, distributed denial of service, where one one public facing IP gets uh, gets targeted by a whole network of malicious uh, PCs or a botnet. Good questions. Good questions overall. Blizzard needs a few of those, yeah. They can, they can hire me. Now nah, I used to live right next to Blizzard in Orange County. Forget that place, man. No thanks. <laughs> Any other questions about firewalls? Uh, those are a lot of good questions. I don't, I don't think Core 1 has a web application firewall objective yet. So I, that's going to be more for NetPlus and Security Plus. If it was up to me, I'd have it in Core 1 because it's a big bullet point. All right. I want to say more high level. NetPlus <laughs> is more... 50,000 foot view, and then as you go deeper into those tests, that's when it gets even deeper. So, don't worry about having to memorize this picture. I just saw this, and I'm like, man, I'm stealing that, because it puts all the objective list on one picture. But, P-O-E. Power over Ethernet. Literally, just talking about carrying voltage over an Ethernet cable. Now, on the dirty side of this, the standards, so 802.3 AF is about 15 watts of power. So 802.3 AF is the standard for basic PoE. 802.3 AT is the standard for a bit more powerful power over Ethernet. You're going to see these in Net Plus. You may see them pop up in A Plus. Now, the important thing to know about this is, or one of them, is for power over Ethernet, you have to have a device that puts out power. So if it's a switch, that switch port has to be labeled as a power over Ethernet port. It has to actually put voltage out. If it doesn't, you're not using power over Ethernet. You're not going to get any power. I like this picture, too, because it brings up PoE devices, wireless access points, being a huge one. Imagine if you had a building with 50 wireless access points and it didn't have power for Ethernet. You'd have to plug them all in. That is not ideal. Routers, etc. I can't believe they didn't put this one in there. VoIP phones. <laughs> VoIP phones is a huge PoE device one. I was asking if you can zoom out. I, I got it, man. I am going to copy this whole whiteboard and throw it up too, guys, so don't stress too much. I know I forgot one of the whiteboards and hurt some feelings. That was my fault, man. My fault. <laughs> Learn from my mistake, by the way. If you have power, if, if the switch is, is giving power over Ethernet and you plug in a device that is not power over Ethernet accessible, <laughs> you will destroy that device. So make sure if you have not plug it in into the wrong built switch. What, why that slow down is so important. What device did you plug up that wasn't PoE capable? Look, I don't want to talk about it. It wasn't really, it was, a, it was a phone. It was a Cisco phone. That's hilarious. Now, so if you have a PoE device and you don't have a PoE switch, you can have a power over Ethernet injector. It's another device that literally adds power to the actual data flow. Quick timeout. Any questions on power over Ethernet standards as they are now? Uh, we, don't, we don't have to worry about CPEs. It's not on the A-plus objective list. I don't even think it's on the NetPlus anymore either.
Now, don't confuse power over Ethernet with another term. Ethernet over power. <laughs> I've seen this described in a few ways. So, Ethernet over power or BPL, broadband power line. Or a power line adapter kit or a power line kit if you're searching for one on Amazon. So these are actually super cool. Uh, yeah, so 82.3 AF is your standard standard 15 watt power for Ethernet. AT is your more powerful one. Uh, for those of you that served in the military, the way I remember this, AT or anti-tank weapons are the most powerful, right? So if you think of AT as an anti-tank, as in the most powerful weapons we have, <laughs> um, that might help. That's how I remembered it, but I'm not sure if that works for everybody. So what a power line adapter kit does, right? Um, how this works it actually will use your power lines in your home as ethernet connections so kind of a garbage picture but it, it'll work so if your router is very far away from your desktop and you still want to avoid wi-fi and use a hardwire kit these power over or sorry ethernet over power adapters or power line kits or broadband power line kits act like two two boxes that plug into your wall outlets and when data goes in from your router it modulates it to a very specific frequency frequency that's unique on the power lines in order to send data um, these have become more and more and more effective meaning they used to be really limited on bandwidth um, now the, the last one I used at my old house it was a solid one gigabit per second Uh, Discord and Twitch are phased out. Can you guys hear me still? Radio check. Yeah. I got back to me. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, unless someone was tapping your actual internal power, these are the power lines inside your house, not like over the power lines outside. These are like the actual electric circuits in your home. You know what I mean? Am I explaining that well enough? I mean, you'd have to have a really advanced threat actor targeting you for that i'm not saying it's impossible but i mean if a professional hacker wants to attack me and get my data they're going to look at my bank and be very disappointed at their time <laughs> i mean yeah i mean i realized that i've been muted this whole time and not been been literally talking to myself <laughs> i was wondering where you went no i've been talking to myself no bling bling. Hey man, when I get extra money, I get new. I get another pair of New Balances, right? That's my bling. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, and, and you're right. There are some uh, vulnerabilities that exist with with this EOP, even over power, but nothing that I think you'd have to worry about in a home network. You definitely need to recognize these 802.3 AF and AT terms. Free points if you get hit with those. All right. Uh, let's go back to our normal zoom in. So for some reason this topic really trips up a lot of students and it's it's not as hard as 
the data that you might find when you research this. Because if you Google DSL technology versus quote unquote cable, you're going to get 20 pages of crap that you don't need. Um, so that being said, DSL is old. And if you notice the connectors, what do you immediately notice about DSL versus Ethernet? It's an RJ11, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's an RJ11. So DSL by standard was was over the old school phone lines. Now, it, it's still kind of used a lot in rural areas out in the country. But DSL is going to be considered legacy or a lower performance network connection compared to cable. Cable is what we talked about in our classic network overlook when we had an actual coax coming into our, our modem. Fiber, we looked at the connections, but if you have a full fiber network, you have a fiber cable running right to your modem. The, you might get some long-winded questions about these, but if you're looking for, hey, what kind of connection does it have? If it has an RJ11 anything, it's not cable. That's going to be DSL. Or if you're looking for the best performance, it's going to be fiber. If fiber's not an option, it's going to be cable Ethernet. For A+, that's about as deep as they go. I think this is just such a dangerous topic because if you Google it, you get a lot of information. Like a truckload. And you don't have to worry about that. Don't go that deep down the rabbit hole. A anybody here rocking DSL right now? I read something last week that DSL is hitting like 500 megabits per second or something in some areas. Which is crazy speeds for classic DSL. Could also have to do with the lack of people using DSL now, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, would, that wouldn't shock me. DSL or satellite. What, no, satellite or DSL uses uh, phone lines. So you're not going to have like a satellite DSL description. Uh, I, I guess you could have a hybrid, something like that, but that would be a really weird setup. I mean, I guess, I mean, maybe I should say legacy setup. Uh, 802.3BT is not covered on the CompTIA exams. Uh, someone asked about the 802.3 BT. No stress on the BT stuff. Honestly, if 20 of you test, two or three of you might get 802.3 AT. I mean, it's that, it's that rare. Or AF, sorry. Pretty straightforward. Any questions on DSL legacy versus cable Ethernet versus fiber descriptions? No, no, you don't. Long gone, thankfully. Now let's talk about that fiber you guys are uh, discussing right now. New acronym for this test, ONT, Optical Network Terminal. So actually, the house I'm living in right now, I've been here for literally about two months. Well, yeah, it's been about two months. And this is the first time I actually had a modem that had an optical input directly into the modem. On the professional side, like the enterprise or business level side, the ONT might not be a home, home modem with a fiber input, but it might be an actual separate de box acting as a DMARC on the outside of the house. So really, if you remember ONT is optical network terminal in your home, it's a modem that takes a fiber connection. In a business, like notice this says, says Nokia on the side of it, <laughs> a business might have an actual box on the outside of the building that takes 
that fiber input and converts it into uh, copper connections internally. I just thought it was interesting because this ONT term was not on the last generation of exams. So kind of interesting. ONT, optical network terminal. Yep, Nokia. I saw another picture that said Verizon on it. Verizon offering their own ONT options for fiber, I guess. Hey, only a few more terms to go, guys. We want to get RT down here with these. So we have to talk about software-defined networking. A few remaining, um, a few remaining network devices, and then we're going to watch some uh, some fancy videos on the network tools because I think it's easier to watch them happen than, than pictures. This is another topic that pisses everybody off. <laughs> um, so SDN stands for Software Defined Networking. And this picture is even more complicated than it needs to be. But think of a network in the infrastructure that we've been thinking about so far. So up to this point, we've been thinking about the data coming into the router, maybe going from the router to some switches, and then going from the switches to the PCs classic infrastructure setup on a larger network the data flows might not might not be dependent on how the network is physically set up the data flows might be dependent on a specific software set so there may be a software loaded onto the network that makes computer a and computer b talk directly to each other or as so it would seem even though they're not on the same network so with SDN, that just means that there's some software in between the applications you're using and the actual infrastructure that really determines the, the flow of traffic in that network. This is a very, very vague term. And this is another one that if you Wikipedia it, you're going to get a lot. Get a lot of information. Is that, is that a legit picture in the chat? Do you still use a Nokia flip phone? <laughs> yeah, so when you see this acronym SDN for Software Defined Networking, there's literally just a software that determines how data flows on that network versus the infrastructure classic way we've been thinking about network devices. So ultimately, if we were to boil this down to a super simple definition, SDN, a specific software, determines how data flows on the network. That's it. Can you give an example of SDN? Yeah. Um, well, the problem with SDN is it's it's a really vague description. Um, I think it might be easier to look at something called like, something along the lines of VLANs on how VLANs work. So check this out. So looking at this super simple diagram, right? We have computer, old school computer, connected to a switch, right? Connected to more switches, to more PCs. So this is a kind of a classic infrastructure setup. Somewhere there'd be a router connecting to the outside world. But with software-defined networking, the admins might load software on any network device, and that software might say, hey, you know what? We're going to make these three computers look like they're on their own network, and these three computers think they're on their own network, even though they're physically connected. That software would limit how the data can move in between these. So if host A was sending data to host B, even though they're on different switches, 
that software is making them think they're on their own network. So it's 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 all software based. So we're taking the rules of how data might flow over an actual classic infrastructure and, and throwing them out the window. Saying, here's how the infrastructure is set up, but the software is making the data move in this way. Is, is that, I'm trying not to get too deep because SDN is kind of a really vague term. I mean, it's super vague. But this, I don't see, I mean, there, you're going to find questions on the test for this, but I don't remember seeing a lot. And it's more of a, it's more of just a basic understanding of SDN. It's just, like you said, software-based net defining of a network or physically defining of a network. Mm -hmm. um, there really wasn't anything that went way too deep when it comes to SDN. Uh, yeah, both. yeah, both. Yeah, it could be either or. Absolutely. Uh, for example, <laughs> when, when I'm logging in and troubleshooting issues on my network, I have IP addresses. So I have IP addresses to the origin servers, public and, and private IP addresses to the Wii's Palo Alto switching networks, but I have all those IP addresses. Inside of those devices, though, I have VIPs. A whole list of virtual IP addresses, not re not not IP addresses assigned to physical devices. They're virtual IP addresses, and those virtual IP addresses can be set up through the software in 20 different ways to connect directly to other devices, even though it's all virtual IP addresses. So there's, there's kind of two thought processes: what's physically connected and how's the data flowing. The inside, you know, monster server number one. How many virtual IP addresses do I have, and what what are the rules on those IP addresses, and how they can send data through the software? And not to get too in depth, I mean it, it also helps with the cost. You know, my my location I'm at, you know, you have each floor of the building is you know switched out, and then in that floor you have different departments. So we VLAN out a department on that floor. I don't have to take each computer and physically connect it to whichever you know the physical means takes time takes effort takes technology a software one you just say this this device is in this network and only this network and you just quickly do it it, it is, saves time it saves energy and you can keep things separated and it, it bothers me that Contia throws SDN in the core one, but doesn't touch VLANs until Net Plus. <laughs> I'm like, just put them together. Come on. <laughs> That's fine. Tigger, it, it, the reason why you don't go 100% SDN is. Um, do you have a good answer for that, Sean? Basically, you don't need to. It's kind of a, a, a solution sometimes without a problem. Well, I mean, it, it, de it depends on a few things, too. It depends on the regulations in your network. Like, yeah. what, uh, I mean, are you a PCI, like, credit card network or a healthcare industry network? And it depends on the size. The size of the network is also really important. Like, I, we, we, I, like we couldn't go 100% software-defined networking in my environment because my company owns seven different smaller companies that we control, too. So software-defined networking on my entire company would be an absolute dumpster fire. <laughs> like it, it would be very bad because you, you would just have you, you would have a lot of sub networks inside of that network that you don't want software to find. Yeah, it it, it is. That's the thing with IT that and Sean back me on this. There is never a this is the uh, unless you are defined by regulation. There is never like this is the way it's done and this is how it will always be done. It is, okay, what situation do I have? What is best won by money? That's always the big thing. What are, what am I allowed by my higher-ups to spend? Two, what works the best or what has already been set up? And is it worth the time and effort, the sunk cost to change things around? And then, like I said, regu like Sean said, regulation. Is it regulated that I have to have a physical network between, you know, points? The software network, being that they're software, they're connected, there can be a vulnerability. A physical network, if two computers are 
not physically on the same network, for the most part, they physically can't talk to each other. All right, a few more terms we have to get knocked out, and these are these terms are classic A plus questions. So intrusion prevention system versus intrusion detection system. And a big bullet point that you have to know, intrusion prevention detects and prevents. An IPS is going to detect and try to stop an attack. Whereas an intrusion detection system only detects. So an IDS is not going to try to stop an attack at all. It will just alert the admins. Whereas an IPS will detect and try to stop the attack. Now, in addition to these two acronyms, you can have N for network-based or H for host-based attached to them. Meaning you can have a network intrusion detection system, a host intrusion detection system, a network intrusion prevention system, a network or a host intrusion prevention system, or you can have a wireless intrusion prevention system. So if you know IDS and IPS in the absolute base definition, which is not going to change, you have to know this, period. N is just network-based, H, host space. I mean, it, it, again, Tigger, that it really depends on what the resource is and and, and how the network's set up. Uh, there's a lot of variables in the network that would determine that. But if you have a server that's hosting like 20 websites, you're, you're going to have a whole stack of security protocols on it. <laughs> Whoa, back up. What are those acronyms? The base acronyms are IPS, IDS. This down here is just to show you that you can have a network or a host based letter in front of it. But that's all these are. These are all just different variations to either it's specifically a network IDS or a host IDS network IPS or a host IPS or a wireless IPS and I'm not trying to be annoying the test might throw these at you and they look really scary until it's just hey what type of IPS or IDS is it um, I'm, I'm sure there can be there can be wireless intrusion detection I've, I've never seen wireless intrusion detection as a specific though Everything wireless has always been an IPS in my experience. I'm sure it exists, but I bet money in Vegas you're not going to see it on an A+. Plus. Now, on top of those IDSs and IPSs, I want to add something that is not officially on the A+, plus ejected list, but it gets kind of thrown in randomly. A next generation firewall NGFW and this one sounds scary it's a firewall with an IPS built in that's all a next generation firewall is I think I get so many questions about that because it's so hard to research a what the hell is this <laughs> 100% is a marketing gimmick. Well, yeah. it's not a marketing gimmick. The name is a marketing gimmick. But this is also a standardized term. So don't let, don't yeah. think that it's a, uh, it's not going to definitely pop up on Net Plus, but they're, we're finding this term more and more just floating around every IT exam. Let me find it. For what? I was... uh, Star Trek references, next generation. Oh. I was never a Star Trek fan, not gonna lie. Oh, you're about to anger a lot of people. That's fine. I just... 
I just feel like their their ships are garbage. Utopian for me. Too kumbaya. I, I don't I don't feel like that's <laughs> like, oh my god, here we go. Shit talk Star Trek radar, okay? Oh, well, we, nobody's oh, shit talking. Oh, oh, I oh, never oh. said that it was bad. I just said it was too utopian for me. Yeah, and it's like, you know what? That big of a ship, you couldn't get better weapons? It's all, all, it's all I'm thinking, you know? I don't know. Technically, the ships we saw were scientific ships. They weren't battle carriers or cruisers, stuff like that. Yeah, right, like the F-35 is a scientific plane, too. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny anything about the F-35. Oh, sorry. You do not work for Lockheed Martin. I don't know what you're talking about. He, he works. It, it sounds like a very reputable, quality company. Scott works, Scott works for a company called Rockheed Morton. Morton. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Rockheed Morton, not not not. Yes, not. Yes, I, I've heard of them. <laughs> they build baby bottles and. Uh, 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 high yes, high chips. All right, UTM, Unified Threat Management. So this is a weird one, and this is uh, it's it's easy to define but weird to give an example of. So a UTM, Unified Threat Management, is a single device that handles all security aspects of a network. And the reason I say this is such a weird-ass term, small networks, you're not going to find a UTM. Really, really large networks, you're not going to find a UTM. <laughs> like, my network, this would never work. I mean, we have, like, defense in depth. We have layers and layers and layers of security devices. So a, a UTM, it's hard to give an example other than a very secure, medium-sized business and network where you'd find a UTM. Uh, UTM stands for Unified Threat Management. Unified Threat Management. It's a single device that manages all security aspects on a network. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I think it, it would be more accurately defined as a good security solution for a medium-sized, very secure network. Now that being said, how much do we think these cost? Ten K. We got one dollar in the Twitch chat. One dollar, Bob. One dollar, Bob. Uh. I mean, everything from 1.1 million for a single device, going down to uh, you know, only 42 grand. I'm sure, it goes down to you know, 10 grand. So. Oh. I'm very uh, knowledgeable of multiple of those products, and you might see those in the corporate world if you go to a big company that I can neither deny or confirm. Can, can either confirm or deny Fortinet network devices. Um, but some of these network devices get really, really expensive. Um, we just had a conversation in my environment. Our... our uh, we looked at the um, Wi-Fi analyzers uh, in the Wi-Fi section where you can download it on your phone. A Wi-Fi analyzer is also a standalone device. And I, I looked at the price of the ones we use. They're about 4000 a pop, handheld devices. So, I mean, even though it's a small little handheld Wi-Fi analyzer, it's not something you want to you wanna accidentally destroy at work. <laughs> um so just be, be wary that some of these devices get really, really, really uh, expensive. This might be... Oh, good. Uh, 
uh, they are way more sensitive and they give you a lot more data. And in and, and a lot of environments, the Wi-Fi scans have to be compliant, so it has to be an approved vendor or an approved device generating those reports. Yeah, um, so all of the above. It gives you a lot more information. A lot more, a lot more reporting capabilities. Like I can generate monstrous reports off our Wi-Fi scanner, which I do every single month. Um, yeah, that's that, that's the big bull point. I think it makes them expensive. Who's heard of a load balancer? So a, a load balancer, I think of it like a GPS for your networks. <laughs> so, you know, when you're using Waze app to drive somewhere, it's going to find the least congested route for you to take, right? That's what a load balancer does. So a load balancer is a device that ensures data is taking the most efficient route. Now, load balancers can also be placed on, like, web servers. So, um, if you have three load balancers in front of a web server, those load balancers can take in requests and take turns called round-robin load balancing. So, those devices can just basically act as traffic cops for, for traffic going from the public to a web server. So a load balancer is, is, is there just to act like a traffic cop to make sure one route isn't super congested all the time while others are not used. Now, these are very similar to proxy servers. And proxy servers have some evil verbiage attached to them. So a proxy server acts as an intermediary between networks. An intermediary between networks. And I think we've probably encountered this before. So let's say you're trying to go to a website, um, Netflix from your work network. Does anybody have uh, Netflix blocked on their work network? That's a sign of a good admin. <laughs> so you try to get a network and, to Netflix and your work network says, nope, shut down. Can't do it. Well, if you were to connect to a proxy server, so a proxy does a few things. One, that proxy will relay data on behalf of the sender. So I'm sending data to the proxy requesting data from Netflix. So Netflix will transfer data to the proxy back and forth, regardless of what the, the rules are to, this pro, to, to Netflix. But two, and a big thing that happens, like if you're using a VPN like Nord or ExpressVPN, they use a series of proxies as well. But Netflix, when seeing this proxy, that's as far as Netflix can see. So if I'm in the USA and I connect to a German proxy, let's just say Ramstein, Germany, because they have really fast proxies that I use. Netflix will show me the German public-facing website for Netflix because Netflix thinks I'm in Germany requesting information from them. So one, a proxy relays traffic. And two, it hides your location. The actual resource you're accessing can only see up to where the proxy is. Now, I'm not trying to say you should do anything illegal. I would never say that. However, comma space, 
there's a difference between illegal and immoral. So, quick tangent that actually applies to this definition of proxy. If you're buying video games, one, you should always be checking G2A.com. You should always be checking G2A.com or like CDKeys.com. Or GreenManGaming.com. Or, um, I think it's Kingwin.net. I haven't used Kingwin in a while. Hopefully it's not a bad website. Yeah, I use Kingwin all the time. More for like uh, certain keys for certain products that Windows likes to use. Or Windows itself. So, I, I mean, my go-to is... Uh, G2A or CD keys, but the, the reason I'm bringing this up, um, do you guys, for you gamers, do you guys remember when um, Far Cry 5 came out? That was what, three years ago? Three and a half years ago now? Probably four years ago now. All right, if you're not a gamer, don't worry about it. It was a big AAA release, but I was on CD keys and, and Steam... And Steam, the gold edition to that game was $99. So that's how much it cost in Steam. On CD keys, I found that same edition this, for a Steam key for $26. But it was a region-locked CD key. So it was, it was a region-locked product key. So what I did was... I think that one was like European. I had to log into Ramstein into Germany to, to do it. But what I did was I bought the $26 key. I enabled a VPN on my entire computer. Closed Steam, reopened Steam, put in the CD key, and it started downloading from my proxy in Ramstein, Germany. It's not illegal. Is, is it moral? That's not my problem. Uh, I'm, I'm not worried. I'm not worried about that. But the reason that worked is because this proxy literally publicly projects your location from wherever that proxy is. So region locked software keys are a big thing there. You can use that to save a truck ton of money. Um, I can't tell you the last time I directly purchased a game from Steam. Sometimes they're the same price if they're brand new games, but I mean I'm talking like even even Windows operating systems. If you're buying an operating system, Micro Center and Best Buy sell them for $126. They're 25 bucks. Windows 11 Pro is 25 bucks on G2A. I don't I don't even think that's region locked. I think that's just a, a universal one, a global one. So if you're buying any software, period, from antivirus to games. Check those websites. I mean, you could call them like gray market. Is that gray market? <laughs> That's about it. But the truth of the matter is, if you live in the United States, soft software prices are jacked sky high compared to a lot of other regions, because they know we'll pay it. My opinion is they kiss my ass. I get on a VPN, and I'll buy it from Russia or from Argentina, and just download it from there. <laughs> That's my two cents. But, oh, good? Honestly, like G2A, I've bought so many software packages from them. I had one, uh, I was using Kaspersky Antivirus, and I had one product key that was already used. And I just emailed the seller, and I got another one in like 13 minutes. And that was the biggest problem I've ever had. And I mean, I've been buying software from G2A for probably about eight years now. So, I mean... I don't know about Kingwin and the other ones very much, but I know you're going to have very few problems um, on G2A and CD keys. CD keys just usually suck in price compared to G2A. But does that example give us an idea of how a proxy works? 
Because that's exactly exactly what I used it for recently. Why do I have a feeling we're all shopping for games right now? <laughs> Close G2A for like two more minutes. To, 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 <laughs> give me give me two more minutes and then we'll, we'll take a short break again. <sighs> I bring up G2A and the class goes silent for an hour. See, I knew I knew I made a mistake, Scott. Made a mistake. The last term on this list. SCADA networks. Oh, look how pixelated this is. So this is called a legacy slash or a legacy embedded network. The only thing that you need to know about SCADA or SCADA, right? SCADA is talking about like manufacturing environments or like utility, like water plants. power plants, etc. When you see that term SCADA, yeah, I mean, I was going to delete it, but I'm like, none of this is important anyway. It's just a, a picture to describe this. But SCADA just means that it's a network that has a bunch of systems on a chip, meaning very small PC systems that have one function. Like if this was a water treatment plant, the SCADA network might be a whole network of just water pressure indicators or water temperature indicators small systems on this network for core one if you're mentally connecting that term SCADA to environments like power plants utility plants or a specialized environment with a bunch of system on a chip you know applications that's all you have to know I mean I wouldn't say SCADA is unsecure because they usually have a stack of security layers on top but skate is always going to be talking about a specialized environment like this where the skater network is just a network of small devices that have a single function like we need to know we didn't know what the water pressure in these pipes are every 10 feet well you have a small system every 10 feet that just pulls water pressure readings I mean, internally, between those small devices, they might be unsecure. But uh, externally, they, they'd probably be pretty uh, pretty secure, outward-facing. Outward yeah, we could probably replace this with a better picture. Uh, it's still pixelated, but whatever. Specialized environments. You do not need to know the full name of SCADA. Why it's even in Core 1, I'm not entirely sure. I can't imagine it's that universally found, other outside of these environments especially. But Think of SCADA or SCADA as a specialized manufacturing or a specialized utility environment. Those questions are real easy if you know that's what it is. Super easy. I mean, realistically, if you haven't checked, have you looked for IT jobs at, like, your local power plant or water treatment plant? Like, they have to have a solid IT backbone. Um, so, you know, water plants, power plants, hospitals, don't forget to look for those IT jobs because they definitely need IT support, too. Kind of heavy. Definitely, Nick. Definitely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> good ones do. <laughs> Mine sucks, but good ones do. I mean, Jeff, Vegas, casinos need IT. I mean, it's, it's across the board, so, you know, it, they're, they're out there. Trust me, they're, they're those IT jobs, and you may have, now he's, he's going to do a, a little, uh, those IT jobs are out there. It, it's, it, you may have to do grunt work for a little while until you build experience. Understand that those grunt work jobs are experience builders. You will build knowledge. Like I said, help desk is not fun, but you, it gets you to learn 
how to visualize environment in your brain instead of having to sit in front of it. Um, you know, it's definitely take a look. That, yeah. By the way, if you like, uh, like I said. Um,
What are y'all talking about? Oh, cool. I said, that's cool. Yeah, dynamics is automatic. All right, is everybody back? I think uh, I think the brakes up. I don't know where my I don't know where my binary timer went. Everybody back? Twitch is still up and running, right? Let me find that window. I need a bigger monitor. <laughs> cool, no worries. No worries, we're about to hit uh, some few t a few tools up, then uh, hit our quiz. Oh, that's just my wallpaper. Yay, fancy wallpaper engine. I highly suggest it. All right. For our tools section, a few networking tools that will be on your test. Not a lot of notes, but I think the easiest way is to just watch it happen. I'm totally going to steal some YouTube videos for this because that's the same thing I would do in class. Um, so the first tool up, uh, hopefully these are muted for everybody. Yeah, these, these should be muted, right? Okay. An Ethernet crimper. So ultimately what a crimper is, it's a tool that is going to attach that RJ45 connector to the end of a cat cable. And it simply does that by inserting the actual Ethernet connector. And when you crimp it down, it pushes those pieces of metal down into the, the cable itself. Now, notice he's using a cable stripper to actually remove the outer coating of the cable. Most Ethernet cables have a, a, a blade built onto them, or sorry, most crimpers have a blade built onto them to actually get the, the coating off of a cable. And this is also where those uh, T568 standards come into play, right? Yeah, yeah, Randy. It's it's not stealing. It's for educational purposes. It's a free class. What are you going to sue me for? But the crimper itself... Hey, there you go. Don't forget about this. Uh, is, it, is that an A or a B standard? That is a Bravo, right? Orange, orange. Orange and brown on each end are B. But realistically, once he has these things lined up, and I like this video because it's pretty high def. Notice how he has the colors lined up, and you can see from the side view that these metal connectors actually have little spikes in the bottom. And when he when he puts that into a crimper or a crimper, a crimper, and presses it down, those spikes are going to go into the actual small color coded cables. Press it down, and now that's permanently connected. Um, from this view, you can see 8P and 6P. Remember that RJ11 is four cables, but it's also called a six-pin forward connector cable. So that's an RJ11 slot. That's an Ethernet slot. And here is your, your cable stripper built into the actual crimper. So a really good view on this. You will have a click and drag question that you have to pick which tool you use for which job. So kind of important to know. Any questions on the cable crimper? The, what's that? Where do you see that? So, 
So, I mean, the, the ground it, it generically is, is the same function as any ground, even like in a power supply unit, right? So it, it, if there's any excess voltage build up on that, it's, it's going to complete the loop to make sure that there's no excess voltage going into your devices. But the, when, you, when you open a cat cable, But don't think that, like, when you open an uh, Ethernet cable, you're, there's not going to be a ninth cable as a ground in there, though. So d don't think that there's a dedicated ground like cable inside of the Ethernet cable. I just want to make that clear in case that was a, a worry, you know? Yeah, an Ethernet cable, you won't have a, a dedicated ground wire. I would agree with that, yeah. I agree with that, and I think it's uh, I think it's easier to think of like network devices, and, and and IT in general that the the devices themselves might have grounds built into them, like a laser printer or a power supply or a battery backup, versus the cabling between them. I think that that might be a, a more straightforward, simplistic way to view that. Yeah, well, and to that point too, you're right. And like we we always talk about the uh, the orange and green for sending data. Well, the power of Ethernet standards we talked about will utilize as blue and brown cables. So when there's power over Ethernet, one of those is going to act as a ground. But it's it's not something that you have to focus on. Like, hey, which one's the ground in Ethernet? I mean, it it, it exists there, but it's not really like a crazy focal point. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we're not going to get any crimper questions wrong. Uh, let's jump to punch down tool. So here's a big kind of pitfall to a lot of test questions. When you're looking at a patch panel or even like this, the back of an a back of an RG45 wall jack, these are not connected with a crimper. When he when he's putting these cables in. They're connected with a punch down tool. And all a punch down tool is, once it gets to it, there you go. All a punch down tool is, it's like a it's like a sharp screwdriver. Um, notice that one side, if I can get a clean picture here, one side has a protruding blade on it. So when you're punching down these cables, if you keep that on the outside, it'll cut away the excess cable coming off of the connection. And let's, let's get to the actual punch down part. So notice how he's using this to punch down those cables. And if he were pressing harder, these would cut through and break off where you can just twist them off and break them. So notice he's keeping the big blade on the outside. There it is on the outside. So it cuts the, the excess off. So it's not like you have to measure and get it exactly right. The, the punch down tool will cut the rest of the excess off when you're putting this ethernet cable onto a patch panel or a wall jack. Pretty straightforward, I think. Any, uh, any questions on a crimper versus a punch down? Cause that's definitely a test point.
No, I mean, they're not really something you have to adjust. I mean, realistically, when I used to make cables, I would just light pressure and score the outside. Kind of a light cut, and then you can just bend it and, and break the outside off. I mean, realistically, I had a uh, I had a Gerber pocket knife that I would just roll on the outside of the cable and, and break it off. Yeah, that that works equally well. You're not like you're not you're not having to ensure you're cutting all the way through the outside of the cable. You're more just scoring it to make it break easier. No, that, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, that's definitely not something you have to worry about because it's not like you have to measure it exactly and then full force squeeze it. You're just lightly squeezing it so it makes a small cut, and that makes the outside easier to break off and, and pull off. Yeah. Good question. All right, a tool that you might not have experience with. In your notes, a toner probe. How to use a toner probe. A toner probe can also be called a tone generator or fox and hound. Those are all the same names. And you have to know that a toner probe is used to trace and locate cables. That is the job of a toner probe, to trace and locate cables. Now, in this example, he has the generator part of the toner probe connected to one side of the cable. And he's trying to figure out where on the patch panel this goes. So if you come across a patch panel that's not labeled, you can attach the generator part to one end of the cable, and you can use the actual probe part, and once you touch it with the probe part, the cable that's connected to the generator will make a unique sound. Now if we, so he connected the generator part, and now he's at the patch panel, and he needs to find out where it's going. So the funny part about this video is he goes through the entire patch panel. He's like all the way down here, and it's actually down here. <laughs> so we'll zoom ahead. And then once he touches the correct one, it starts making an audible beep. So once he touches the correct cable, he knows that's the cable that he plugged the generator into. So the toner probe or tone generator or fox and hound, all the same words, are used to trace and locate cables. That's a big bullet point for A+. On, uh, not, uh, not on the A+, plus. Them, but, sorry. Not on the A+, but I would also note that you should not attach a tone generator to something that's plugged into a network interface card. Like, you don't want to put a tone generator on a cable that's connected to a desktop. You're, you could destroy the NIC. So just on a side note there, uh, <laughs> that's a big, a big don't do bullet point in the IT world. Go ahead, Scott. What were you gonna say? I said I always imagined that only in like Britain or do they call it a fox and a hound? It sounds so much like oh, a cat gets a fox and a hound out. Let's find where this goes. Like nowhere in the United States. <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think it's a regional thing. I think it's more of like an older IT term, but still floating around. They said... What? That, thanks, Scott. All the Europeans in class right now are just making fun of us. <laughs> hey, hey, chap. Hey, chap. <laughs> can't say I blame him much, honestly. <laughs> Do I have any questions on Toner Probe or Fox and Hound or Tone Generator? Or why it's so easy to make fun of Americans? Because it is. So the one I used was, uh, it wasn't like a RJ45 port, it was just gator clamps. So a, any any metal connector would work with the tone generator. Um, I'm sure there are ones that are specific to Ethernet, but my, mine was just electric gator clamps. 
So you can put it on any color pin in an RJ11 or connect it to a coax pin or anything. No, I mean with gator clamps, you, you could you could literally just connect it to any color. If if it was a cable that was like patch to patch, where there wasn't an RJ45, any as long as you put that clamp on like the green green cable, and you can you were tapping the green cables, it, it would connect. Yeah. I'm sure mine was a super cheap one. I think mine was like $14 at Micro Center. So mine wasn't a super fancy one by any means. <laughs> I'm sure the beefy ones have all kinds of specific ports. Actually, I'm pretty sure mine had an Ethernet port on it too, if I remember correctly. But pretty straightforward. If I asked you for tracing and locating cables, definitely, uh, definitely know that that's a toner probe and finally a loop back plug so check this diagram out remember we discussed that pins one and three transmit data i'm oh, sorry one and two transmit data three and six receive data so transmit receive this diagram shows exactly what a loop back plug is you can make your own with a crimper if you want to but all a loop back plug is is an ethernet or rj45 that transmits data back to itself so I would note that these loopback plugs are used mostly for diagnostics if you want to check to see if an Ethernet port is functioning you can plug up a loopback plug and if you have transmit and receive lights lighting up on it you know that port is is functioning appropriately so a loopback plug is used mainly to make sure the actual physical Ethernet port is functioning appropriately. Now, do not confuse all of those tools with a cable tester. So, speci specifically, an Ethernet cable tester comes in two, there's two parts to it. Plug one end of the cable into one, one into the other one. And the lights will tell you which pins are connecting to which pins. I'm sure he does that here too. I haven't watched this video actually yet. Yay. How to plug it in. Good job. All right. So once you start it, you should see these lights matching up to each other. Now, notice that he's getting one to one, two to two, three to three, four to four. That's a straight through cable. If you had a crossover cable, A on one side and B on the other, you would have one matching the three, two matching the six. So pins, the orange and green swap. So pins one and three and two and six will swap. Um, I've had people make cables and one lit up on one side and one and three lit up on the other side or one and two lit up, meaning there was a cross in one of the, one of the cables or it was crimped in a weird way. Um, so you should only have one-to-one -one lights, and if it's a straight through, pin one will go to pin one, pin two to pin two. If it's a crossover, pins one and three will be switched, and two and six will be switched. So don't confuse crimper or punch down with a cable tester. Whew, questions. Yes, yep. That's exactly. Basically, you're making sure the cable's created correctly. All 
Uh, for A+, plus, I don't think they're going to hit you with 1 to 3 and 2 to 6, specifically those numbers. Net plus, you're going to have to know on a crossover, 1 goes to 3, 2 goes to 6. Yeah, because if you think about it, like T568 Alpha versus Bravo, right? Alpha is green, green, orange. Bravo is orange, orange, green. Yep. Because, I mean, pins switching from one one and three and two and six, that's just a really fancy way to say the, the green and orange are, are switching, right? That's the same thing. Yep, yep. Yep, Kearns is through a picture of a, a loopback plug. Very useful. Do I have any questions at all before we hit this large practice quiz? That's what everybody's been waiting for, right? The quiz. <laughs> See 10 people drop from the chat immediately or run away. Oh yeah. You play star citizen, Jeff. Let's jump on. <laughs> uh oh, we got, we got another star citizen person. Of course, I'm not con I'm not concierge like Scott is over here. <laughs> All right, Kahoot.it. Go ahead and jump on Kahoot.it and throw in this game pin, or I will throw the link into both chats. You can also join on your phone, by the way. Uh, maybe it depends on how my week goes. My week was kind of train wreck this week, but uh, possible for sure. Yeah, Scott. Whoever did that next plus, you know, just hit us up in Discord, and we'll get you in touch with Scott. Yeah, yeah, we'll plug in. Yeah, I'll plug it in. Yeah, yeah, we'll plan it. Yeah, um, Scott, you gonna be at the Bama game today? Gonna try. I don't get off till four. So. All right, all right. See you, see you. Yeah, it definitely helps having um having multiple instructors in the room. It helps uh helps add detail back and forth. Hey, do me a favor. Don't get demoralized by this quiz, all right? This quiz is going to require you to read carefully. Uh, some of them have pictures for sure. Some of them have full network diagrams. <laughs> No pain, no gain. It's just it's just mental repetitions, right? It's all it is. Lifting weights for your brain. Oh God. Why why is Linus in my chat? <laughs> Yeah, this is, a uh, yeah, 60 questions. Yep. Some of them are multiple choice. Some of them are select all. Some of them are drag and order. Some of them are type in the answer. I 
I don't believe time domain reflectometer is is on the core one objective list anymore. I think it's only core or uh, it's only net plus. Net plus will have a TDR and then an OTDR optical time domain reflector reflectometer. We got 20, 20 in the quiz and 30 in the class. What's, what's everybody afraid of? Don't be afraid. Or just take your cell phone and take a picture of this QR code. QR code it up. Jump it on your phone. We give everybody about uh, 30 more seconds and we're kicking it off. There might be some rain questions in here. Who knows? All right. Question one. I don't know what this Halloween theme is, but it's pretty sweet. Also keep an eye on the timer. Some questions, most questions are 30 seconds. Some of them are one and a half, two minutes. Five seconds. All right, that one might have been a little fast. <laughs> Uh, just be aware, a lot of us chose green. Make sure you don't choose any IP address with a number above 255, all right? Be very defensive on that on your uh, CompT exams. Don't choose any number above 255 as an IP address answer. This one's relatively easy, right? Relatively. Okay, very nice. Thunderbolt hits up to 40 gigabits per second. 40 gigabits per second. So that's uh, that's a big one for Thunderbolt 3.0. Instant 12 answers. Is that too easy? Yep, PRL. Does anybody remember what that stands for? That's that preferred roaming list. That's that database of information that needs to be updated in your phone. It basically tells it where to expect to get information from, what type of networks and whatnot. So when traveling to a different country or a different region altogether, you probably might want to update your phone's PRL, preferred roaming list. 
It's anybody's game at this point. You got a lot of quiz left. Okay, a lot, a lot of points. So 25 SMTP, 110 is pop, 995 is secure pop, 143 is IMAP. Very good. Just make sure you have those email ports, at minimum the email ports, memorized before you test core one. Oh, boo, we just hit this. Not fair. Did the, the military way of memorizing this uh, help us? AT, anti-tank, the most powerful of Ethernet standard? Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Look at this fun verbiage. Oh, nice. So modem comes from modulate, demodulate. Remember, that's just converting analog data to digital data. That is a description, long-winded description of a modem. Very nice. Let's get to the fun questions. Bit soup. Oh, that is a typo. Yep. 19 you got it right. It's supposed to be UEFI, not EUFI. My fault, guys. But take note of this description. Offers full driver support for keyboard and mouse with the use of a GUI. That is the UEFI. My bad. Typo there. Should be UEFI, not EUFI. So if you're one of the three that got robbed from that, that's my fault. Classic style CompTIA question. Classic.
Ooh, okay. So some of us got it down. Um, but this one, if you remember that A and AC are only 5 gigahertz, the rest of them offer 2.4 gigahertz. So I, I would note that A and AC are only offering 5 gigahertz frequencies. Super important. Make sure you know Wi-Fi frequencies and transfer rates before you hit that exam. Ooh, this next one's a fun one. Uh, take note, I think, I'm pretty sure I gave you extra time on this one. Yeah, 120 seconds. <laughs> I'm curious who gets this one right. This is not an easy question. Fifteen seconds left. <laughs> Ooh, all right, so let's talk about this one. The red answer can't have a letter above F, so the R in there is wrong. What's wrong with this blue answer? So there's nine hextets which violate our 128 bit rule. This yellow one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hextets. Now, if there's a double code in here, that would make sense because that could that could make up for them. But you can't have just seven sets of numbers or hextets without a double colon. So that's not 128 bits either. This one down here, you you cannot have five characters. There's not five numbers in a hextet. So the only valid ones are these two. Six hextets of zeros plus that, or this guy. Both valid. That one was hard. Anybody get points for that? One, per <laughs> one person. That's all right. Nice job, Moot. That was a savage question. Don't stress. That one was hard. lot of us took the raid five option bait <laughs> well 
Well, and don't, and that's a good point. Don't confuse the minimum requirements for the performance aspect, right? I mean, three drives in a RAID 0 is extra fast. So three drives in a RAID 0 is going to be your fastest answer. Hardware means that there's a RAID controller card making it the fastest answer. A little bit of a bait. Again, don't let this quiz demoralize you. This is a, this is a challenging one. Oh, network diagram time, huh? Yep, you want to have your channel broadcasting the furthest channel away. So, I mean, if a house is 500 meters, it better not be interfering with your house anyway. But if you have multiple channels, you want to be the furthest away non-overlapping channel. So you want to be on 1, 6, or 11, which one is, whichever one is the furthest away from everybody else. Very good. You may see something like this on a future exam of some sort. Leaderboard scrambling. Yep, that CMOS battery. So if the system time and date is off, replacing the CMOS battery is going to be your go-to. BIOS jumpers, the jumpers on the, the motherboard for BIOS reset a BIOS password. So that won't fix system date and time not being recovered. Ooh, moving on up. Some of us are ready to take a test. You have uh, extra time for reading here. Well, I didn't do this to you. I did it for you. So you got to use positive statements. <laughs> Oh, very nice. So classic example of a technician forgetting to reconnect the cable to the, the antenna itself to the wireless network interface card. So if you get a situation where, hey, something was just replaced inside, and all of a sudden I can only pick up one bar of Wi-Fi even right next to the uh, wireless access point, reconnect that antenna. Or make sure the technician didn't break it 
when they were fixing something on like with the laptop hinges or something. Yeah. Currency moving up. Motivated moving up. Right, the definition of hyperthreading or AMD's SMT. Each core processes multiple requests per CPU. Each core doesn't process multiple virtual cores, right? It's not doing that. The the remember back to like day one, right? We were looking at how when each core takes multiple requests per clock cycle, that's what creates a virtual core. The system sees a single execution unit or a core taking in two different requests, creating one virtual core per physical core. So it, even if, you, if you're looking at processor specs, if it's a 16 core processor, you're not going to see anything more than 32 logical cores because each core only has a single virtual core associated with it because of this multitasking. The, the verbiage is half the fight, right? When, when the, the wording gets a bit more savage, it, it's harder to, to pick out the key points there. Any questions so far? Oh, Matt's on, Matt's on an answer of three, streak of three. Is this quiz helping us? Kind of uh, sharpen the edges a little bit. It's so quiet without Scott in here. There we go. All right. No crying. It's just fun repetition. Uh, you got 90 seconds. Read carefully. Please don't wait two weeks to replace a swarm laptop battery. <laughs> don't wait. Don't wait two weeks. Don't click that one. Thirteen answers. The two correct answers, only select field replaceable units are considered standardized hardware, that is correct, and the antenna is located around the bezel. An FRU is a field replaceable unit. Kind of a weird acronym that might get puked in there somewhere. A field replaceable unit. For example, a laptop motherboard is not considered a field replaceable unit. 
simply because a lot of those laptop motherboards are made specifically for that model. So that's a dirty acronym in there. Laptops do not have full PCIe16s. You cannot switch laptop CPU and desktop CPUs. Don't wait two weeks to replace a battery. And only LCD laptops have inverters, not LED or OLEDs. Again, rough questions. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be the one to test that. <laughs> Is Linus like, what the hell? <laughs> I mean, you're going to find exceptions to everything, but that definitely won't be standard practice ever, I hope. Look at this. I get a true or false question. See, we're lightening up a little bit. Easy questions. That is true. So a docking station will have some sort of expansion capability, like an SD card slot that makes it a docking station. A port replicator, like a USB hub, is just a port replicator. No expansion option whatsoever. Very nice. Lots of points in that one. Could have written this question to say what is the only example of MFA? <laughs> Remember, multi factor authentication has to be two of three something you have, something you know, or something you are. So, this is both something you have, this is both something you are. This is both something you know. The only one that's MFA is something you know and something you have. A combination of the factors of authentication. <laughs> CompTIA loves to do that to you too, by the way. Best or first. They love to throw those out there. But the, the biometric one is not an example of MFA. Straightforward question. Thunderbolt 2.0. Yep, Thunderbolt 1.0 is 10 gigabits per second, 2.0 doubles to 20 gigabits per second, 3.0 doubles again to 40 gigabits per second. So each one starting at 10 gigabits doubles as it goes up a generation. Remember, SFF, small form factor, a small size. That was one of our specific notes on our fiber connectors whiteboard.
Yep, Fiber LC. LC and a Net Plus LC and MTRJ will be your two small form factor. Don't miss free points on those descriptions. Oh, back to hardware. <laughs> um, so looking at these pins, um, remember that with a pin count, a serial port having nine pins helps you identify the technical name. So a serial port is also called a DB9, whereas a parallel port, the big pink plug, is also called a DB25. So these two examples are specifically great examples of, hey, the number of pins are the technical answer. Oh, Matt, Matt's the one that got it right. Uh-oh. <laughs> Matt, I think it's time to schedule your exam, man. Get it on the books. Oh, savage. Oh, nice, 12 people. So remember that when you look at this DVI interface, the pins on the right-hand side here, those are all the digital or video. So that D stands for digital. That's the video capabilities. For DVIs that have the four pins around this ground, that's a the, the, if it has the four pins and this side, that's an integrated DVI-I. So this that does not have the sound or analog capability. So this is just a DVI-D for digital. This is also a, a trouble point, uh, troubleshooting point that I came across this week um, where somebody was trying to use a DVI to HDMI adapter and they couldn't get sound. So you can, connect, you can connect this to an HDMI adapter and use the HDMI cable, but there's not going to be any sound because those four pins are not existent on the DVI. So kind of a big troubleshooting thing in real world if you come across it. Um, I don't think they're going to get this critical with you on the A+. Yeah, if you have a DVI-I, it'll, it'll transmit video and sound. Yep. If the receiving device can take sound from a DVI. So kind of an evil question. A lot of correct answers. Solid. Oh, yay, networking. Oh, buddy. All right. Hold on. Let's talk about this. So <laughs> remember with the CIDR notation, that slash 25 just means that there's 25 network bits in the IP address, right? So the first 25 are network. That means the last seven are host bits because there's 32 total bits. <laughs> Am I explaining that well enough? 
Do we remember that this is the network bits? The rest are host bits. <laughs> so a, that slash number just means out of the 32 bits in an IPv4 address, 25 slash 25 means the first 25 are network bits. That means the last seven, because there's only 32, the last seven are host bits. Yep. I think I think we probably remember it after me saying this. I hope. <laughs> All right, next question. Moti Baby got it. Again, this is a challenge quiz. All right, this is a this is not an easy quiz. The PC number tells you the bandwidth. When you divide this number by 8, you get the refresh. 1,000 megahertz. Thankfully, not many people chose gigahertz as options. RAM is not refreshing gigahertz. Divide by 8, and you got the 1,000. Very good. Oh, easy questions coming up. Very well, I guess we'll do them. Yep, that is the drum. So if you have a repeating smudge or streaks, that is the drum to blame. Very good. A lot of free points on that one. Very good. Looking at this old school VGA, these do not put out sound at all. So looking at these VGA ports, there's 15 pins or DB15. They are internally they're the same as the old component cables. The individual red, green, blue, five pins dedicated to red, five pins to green, five pins to blue. So VGA, even though you can buy a VGA to HDMI adapter. Don't expect it to perform like an HDMI cable. VGA is old school and will not give you that sound and video output. Ooh, hard question coming up.
All right, don't waste time. Study. <laughs> Four people pick false. <laughs> don't waste time studying charts that you might encounter where it's like transfer rate of Cat 5e at 55 meters versus 100 meters. Golden rule: 100 meters or 328 feet for Ethernet cable. Yep, you might get many questions that want you to know Cat5 maxes out at 100 megabits per second. That's the ultimate point here. Cat5 is a max of 100 megabits per second. Anything above that, Cat5e is considered the first gigabit networking cable. Broke three streaks. Hey, this isn't directly on your core one exam or anything. source of system failure is RAM. Very good. The main component that causes most system failure is RAM. It's very sensitive and very volatile. Even if they throw beep codes in, you don't have to remember memorize beep codes specific because they're, they're manufacturer specific. So if you get a system error with beep codes, I would blame RAM first because that's the main source of system failure. Hey, very good. It, it looks oddly specific, but there's some bait words in here. Heuristic analysis, obfuscation, non-repudiation. Not words that relate to Wi-Fi or wireless technology. Bluetooth, 2.4 gigahertz. Wi-Fi, 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. So NFC standard, 13.56 megahertz. Not that you had to know that, but NFC is the only short band small or low megahertz wireless on this list of wireless options. Just a heads up, if you see 13.56 megahertz short band, that's a really obnoxious way to describe NFC. But I'm willing to bet the bait answers for that will be clearly in gigahertz. Uh, you will see these terms coming up in NetPlus and Security Plus, by the way. So those aren't fake. Those are real. It's not in this exam.
<laughs> There's a real easy way to break this one down. Anybody got an easy way to attack this one? No, I mean, that happens to be true here, but okay. yeah. So remember that a class C has 254 usable hosts, right? As a basic description of class C. Anytime you have more host bits than a class C, you have at least 254 usable. So notice all three of these answers are below a slash 24. So if you knew that class C had 254 usable hosts, you know that anything lower than that on the CIDR has more host bits. So if you have more than eight host bits, you have more than 254 usable hosts. The wrong answers are all less than eight host bits. So you're, you're in the four, five, ten here. You have less than 254 usable. I promise that gets way easier in networking when we hit subnetting in its entirety. Hey, eight people hit three streak. Very nice. Oh no, who took the bait? Who took the bait? Ooh, can I have a 261 in an IP address? Be on the lookout for octets above 255. <laughs> if you did, that's all right. Yeah, that one was a fast timer. Uh, that was set for 20 seconds. I don't know why. They were all supposed to be defaulted. F. Man, misclicked on the easier questions. Rough. <laughs> Good thing on the real exam, you have to click submit, right? The real exam is not bar trivia status. But for a PIPA, please know 169.254 is a clear indicator of an APIPA address. Gotta, gotta know that before, your, before any exam, not just A+. plus. Question 33 of 60. This one's a 60 second question. It should be. Very nice. Some of us got some free points. Do I have any questions on these options? Why Rob? Yellow, red, orange, black. 
12 5 3 point feet ground. <laughs> Very good. Ooh. Lots of scrambling on the leaderboard. Uh, the answer is blue. It's supposed to be laptop RAM. I don't know how that got dropped. Please click blue. <laughs> the word laptop got dropped out of there for some reason. Should have been laptop RAM. Man, easy question. Sorry. I robbed you guys. I robbed you guys of your streak. <laughs> My fault. Except, bro. All right, a riser card is an expansion card that gives you a expansion slot at a right angle. So that's used if you want to put a larger expansion card in a smaller or small form factor chassis. Very nice. I know my my typos are terrible. Let's all cry about it. <laughs> That clicking sound, you have to back up the data and replace the drive. There's no saving it. Very good. Free points. Remember that true color description, true color is referring to an IPS display. So you will see that IPS described as true color. Um, and that could be like if someone wants to print the same, uh, you know, the same uh, color that is visible on the screen or if someone's doing high end photo or video editing. All that would fall under IPS display. TC for true color. Hey, I didn't go full evil with the acronyms. Super easy question if you remember the rule.
So, learn the rules. Nick, you're right. That parity algorithm in a RAID 5 uses 25% of the drive volume. That, that bullet point can be on a lot of different exams. Notice it's it was very easy math, right? You have 4 terabytes total, and 25% is used by that parity algorithm. Yeah, so when you, the the parity algorithm in a RAID 5 takes up 25% of drive volume. That's where the 3 out of 4 terabytes came from. Hey, very nice. So the, those NVMe drives, they directly connect to the PCIe buses. That's what makes them so ungodly fast compared to other storage options. The fact that they pretty much have a direct highway right to the CPU really helps them out. Yes, you can buy M.2 SATA drives, but they're using the SATA buses in the board. So an M.2 SATA is connecting to an M.2 slot that hits the SATA buses hitting the south bridge, then getting relayed to the CPU. Not nearly as fast as the highway as, as PCIe buses. I know Kernzy's ready to test, man. Yep, virtual RAM is located on the page or swap file of your hard drive. That is correct. Remember we said think of virtual RAM as an overflow on the storage device. Hey Kearns, man, when, when are you scheduling your Core 1 exam? You should be testing like Monday. Uh, I don't know, I gotta figure it out, so. Hey, hey, get on it. You, you could have core, you could have core, core one and core two done before Christmas. You got it. Very good. That is false. The function keys are different for every manufacturer. So if you look at your keyboard, function F6, that's play or pause on my keyboard. It's probably not the same on all your keyboards. So the function keys are not standardized, so you don't have to remember what each one does because they're not the standards. Not the same. Think about this one. 60 seconds.
Ooh, all over the board. All right. So classic exam questions. The North Bridge directly connects processor, RAM, and the PCIe buses. So CPU and RAM are in there. And NVIDIA 3090 is a graphics card, so that's definitely on a PCIe bus, as is an N.2 NVMe. All of those will, will be on the same main highway to the North Bridge. Yep, go, go, going back to our first or second class, NVIDIA and Radeon are key indicators for graphics card descriptions. That's a rough one. Hey, if you're uh, planning on building a new PC soon, have you seen the size of the 4000 series cards? Ooh, they are monsters. <laughs> Jay's two cents put one put one of the Asus ones next to a PlayStation 5 and they're about the same size. <laughs> Time to upgrade my chassis. Which of the following specifically relates to a system's ability to enable full drive encryption? That trusted platform module, that crypto processor on a board is responsible for all the algorithmic work behind full drive encryption. In Windows, it's called BitLocker. So we are going to hit full drive encryption and BitLocker and BitLocker to go a lot more in Core 2. That's not a, that's not a term that goes away. Or if you're a Mac user, file vault, but yeah, no one's perfect. <laughs> hey, same chapter. Hardware security module does not store credentials. That specifically stores keys. And this is another topic that's going to get more evil as the tests go on. So there's a lot of stuff, or some stuff in networking, a lot of stuff in security about asymmetric and symmetric encryption algorithms, block versus stream ciphers. We have to get into a lot more details, so make sure you get these, uh, these fundamental acronyms down now, because they're... Uh, a little savage. 15 correct though. Pretty good. Pretty good. Alright, 127 is the IPv4 loopback, and colon colon 1 is the IPv6 loopback. Very nice. The right answer is just a subnet mask for class C. Forty-six out of sixty. How many network bits are in a slash 22? Yep, 
Yep, just just 22. So, <laughs> I think we need some repetition on this. So rewind. When you see, so an entire IPv4 address is 32 bits, right? A slash number like 22 just says the first 22 of those 32 are network bits. Or if this was a slash 25, it would have 25 network bits. Am I explaining that well enough, or am I uh, am I confusing everybody? Yeah, I'm. I'm just, <laughs> I dumbed myself on that one. So this would have 22 network bits and 10 host bits. Yep, making 32 bits. Let's see what's the next. Oh, okay, yeah. Let's okay. Knowing that, let's let's attack this next question. <laughs> Network bits, not host bits. Network bits. This is one of those, uh, you can hate me now and thank me in net plus, all right? <laughs> three correct okay all right so let's talk about this so if there's a cider a slash 27 that means there's 27 network bits class c by default is a slash 24 right basic class c the first three octets of the network so a class c is a slash 24 class b is a slash 16 by default and of course, the slash 14 tells you there's 14 network bits. Nice work to you three that got it right. That's uh, This is not an easy question. Arguably harder than you'll find on A+, for sure. <laughs> typing, typing, typing. Any questions on this? Throw them out there. Well, A plus, A plus does cover subnet masks, so it's it's definitely um, definitely need to get these down for at least a subnet mask portion of the A plus. I think mean, just understanding how many network bits versus how many host bits will really slingshot you into understanding Net plus that much faster. It, it will. <laughs> um, if you look on YouTube, by the way, I do have a full subnetting boot camp on YouTube posted for those of you that were there. Oh, type in the answer. Even more fun. Ha <laughs> ha 
<laughs> it actually shows what you guys wrote. <laughs> I, 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 that's a new question type. I've never done that before. That's funny. Um, so, port number, type the port number responsible for this. FQDN's IP, that's DNS, port 53. <laughs> Got to get your port numbers down. Oh, no. Okay, uh, yep, another type the answer. It's a single word. And I don't think there are lackadaisical on spelling. Sorry about that. Accuden something? <laughs> Close enough on multiple choice. I'll give you that. <laughs> Attenuation. Very good. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, oh, yeah. We have one more type to answer. One more type to answer. 50 out of 60. It's not resistance, if that helps. Opposition to AC current. This is the last type in the answer. Don't worry. Hey, very nice. Impedance is the correct answer. Impedance is the resistance to AC. In NetPlus, we're going to talk about impedance mismatch. Impedance mismatch. All right. For those of us that suck at spelling, I do too. I think that was the last typing question. Oh, going back to electrical safety. All right, the CompTIA 110-100 rule. One milliamp you can feel. Ten milliamps you lose muscle control. A hundred milliamps, which is only 0.1 whole amp. A tenth of an amp is possible death. So one whole amp is definitely a lethal amount. Kernzy trying to avoid getting getting robbed of the gold medal. Roz is coming up though. Hey, very good. NAT or network address translation converts private to public or public to private. Very good. Network address translation. Definitely an acronym you might see a few times on Core 1. Or Call of Duty on PlayStation. If you're a console gamer.
Hey, technically I'm a console gamer. I have a Switch, alright? Just sitting around waiting for Breath of the Wild 2. <laughs> All right, converting MAC address to private IP address, address resolution protocol, ARP. You're going to see ARP a whole hell of a lot more going through NetPlus and Security Plus. So make sure we have those fundamental acronyms down. Oh, Bra's getting closer to the first place. Can Currency hold on? Hey, very nice. When DHCP fails, a peep of addresses will be prevalent. 169, 254 everywhere. Man, Mo at 57K, hand coded at 57, Raz at 59, currency at 61. It's anybody's game. Got six questions left. Yep, MIMO, multiple input, multiple output, is a specific description of 802.11n. Whereas MUMIMO, M-U-M-I-M-O, will describe AC and AX. So N will be defined by MIMO. Sorry, Galaxy. Had to throw it out there. Yep, we just hit this, right? Optical networking terminal, ONT. You will see this, and I bet you'll see it often simply because it's new to this version of the exam. ONT, optical network, fiber, or fiber modem. 57 to 60. Easy, easy questions are no fun. Also put a bow on this one. Yep, toner probe, trace and locate. We're not going to miss those exam questions.
don't make the mistake of going with crimpers to a wall jack. That's the the punch down tool is that sharp object they use to actually press the color codes into their respective slots. Crimpers are only used to put the actual end cap or the connection onto the Ethernet. So if you're connecting an RJ45 to the end of a cable, you use a crimper. Real close leaderboard. So, creating a latent image on the drum, latent or pending or invisible, that is a description of the writing, also called the exposing stage. Creating a latent or invisible image on the drum is the writing or exposing stage. So, exposing and writing are the same thing. Yeah, developing is when the toner hits the drum. Transferring is when the toner hits the paper. So make sure you're defensive of this verbiage if you see it on any future exams. Latent image describes the writing or exposing stage. Last question. It's a poll. Yeah, the, the developing is the toner specifically to the drum. Yeah. Transferring it, the toner goes from the drum to the paper. There should have been a type in for the poll. Hey, only 30% are, are crying. Crying underwater. It's all right, though. Let's look at the podium. Hey, on this exam, 43 out of 59, or even 40 out of 59 is real awesome. That's really, really awesome. Oh, Ross did steal first place. Dirty. Man, like last three seconds in the fourth quarter stole it. <laughs> Very nice work. That was uh, not an easy quiz. Can we get another massive quiz for the last class? Man, I think we're underestimating how long those take to make. <laughs> no, we'll definitely have a, a quiz of some sort. But realistically, guys, for core one, next Saturday we need to cover the virtualization and cloud chapter, which is really straightforward. And then I want to wrap up some terms that we didn't hit too hard and a few troubleshooting terms. But other than that, core one's done. So next Saturday, core one is done. If you're comfortable up to this point, you should be thinking about when you're going to schedule your exam. All right. I will be around here for a few more minutes if you're watching the recording. I'll see you later.